Hello. I'd like to introduce you to a deaf couple, Kimberly and David Williams. Kimberly, I'd like to ask you a few questions. First, can you share with me about your educational experiences growing up as a child? Well, I attended the Indiana School for the Deaf. I started in 1960 and continued there until I graduated in 1975. Then I came to Minnesota to attend the Technical Vocational Institute, TVI. At TVI, I majored in the deaf program called General Office Practice, or GOP. I've worked ever since I graduated from TVI, so that's my educational background. David, tell me something about your childhood. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. I went to St. Mary's School for the Deaf. All of our teachers there were nuns. I graduated in 1975, the same year as Kimberly. Then I also attended TVI for two years. I majored in civil technology. That's related to civil engineering. And did things like working on highways and such. I've been employed in my field for the past 20 years. Hmm. Is your work interesting? I don't understand what you said about highways. Can you explain a little bit more? All right, well, I work in the soil and cement lab. So what I do is study and do tests on all the different elements used to make the roads. I test the different rocks and granite to determine what are the best stabilizers that are going to help to keep the roads hard and to eliminate any of the weak areas in the pavement. In addition, I test the moisture levels of the cement mixes. So I do testing in both areas. Very interesting. Uh, Kimberly, can you tell me more about what you do? More in depth, if you wouldn't mind. OK, I work for Find Incorporated. We've been around for almost four years now. I work with the Deafblind Community Involvement Program in which volunteers and deafblind individuals go out to different activities monthly to expose the deafblind person to a variety of things. I also do work with an outreach program which teaches independent living skills such as understanding the mail they receive. Oh, let's see. Thirdly, I teach tactile signing as well as American Sign Language. I'm really a, a bit of a jack-of-all-trades. I enjoy the variety, which makes it the best position I've held. Good. Now, are you also involved with the deaf and deafblind community and the activities? Oh, yes. I'm very involved with MDBA, the Minnesota Deaf Blind Association. I'm on their board. I'm active with Find Incorporated and many other groups. I'm much more involved with the deafblind community now than I was in the past. Previously, I was in denial, but now I've accepted that I am a deafblind person. It's part of who I am. I now look on it in a more positive way in that it gives me the opportunity to educate people. David, how are you involved in the deaf community? Mostly, I am also involved with the deafblind community since I help Kimberly in her involvement with the different agencies such as MDBA. I've become more acquainted with her friends, and I have some deafblind friends myself as well. We enjoy going out to restaurants and different social events together. It's really something that the two of us can do together. I'm also active in other parts of the deaf community. 
I'm involved with the deaf sports group Mini Paul and with Thompson Hall events. I like to go to Thompson Hall to see old friends and just to hang out together. So those are a few of the things I do socially. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm impressed. Kimberly is from Indiana and David, you're from New York. And yet the two of you decided to settle down in Minnesota. I think you're crazy. Don't you think it's too cold here? Yes, it's true. It is cold here. I remember back in 1975 when I was graduating from high school. Back then the job market was pretty bleak, so I decided to go to college. I applied to Gallaudet and to TVI. I didn't apply to NTID in New York because I was really bored there and I wanted to move somewhere else. I was definitely ready for a change. Gallaudet didn't accept me because my test scores weren't at their required level. But TVI did. So I entered TVI, and I was there for two years. Really, their program was exceptional. They offered a job placement program, which was encouraging, because New York had such a high rate of layoffs and unemployment at that time. President Carter was in office then, and there was a lot of support at that time for education, but the economy wasn't so great. And that's part of the reason that I wanted to leave New York. Kimberly, can you tell me how you and David met? That's a very interesting story. I actually knew him when we were both attending TVI, but I didn't pay attention to him because I was a good girl, and he seemed a bit rebellious. Anyway, after graduation, we went our separate ways. We met again at a church picnic, fell in love, and eventually got married. I never thought I would marry that guy David from New York. David, is her story accurate, or do you want to add anything? Well, I think she's pretty much right. I guess when I thought about getting married, I didn't think of her first off. But when I got to know her, and what a wonderful personality she had, we were just a perfect match. Kimberly was very supportive. And that really impressed me. So I knew I'd better marry her while I had the chance. And we've been together for 16 years now. Time's really flown. Hmm, 16 years. That's a long time. It hasn't felt that long. It feels more like 10, maybe. More no, less. no, no. I think it feels more like three years. Now, were you married in Indiana or New York? Minnesota. Minnesota, yeah. He's crazy. <laughs> he is. You probably think we're both crazy to come to this frozen land to get married. Well, now what month? You didn't get married in December, did you? Oh, no, no, no. September 27th. Soon is our anniversary. About two weeks. Yeah, I remember when we first came to Minnesota, it was getting pretty cold. But for many people, the onset of fall also means that hunting season is approaching. In the springtime, it was still cold. And there was a bit of, quite a bit of snow, actually, that hadn't melted yet. I remember suffering walking back and forth from Emma's to TVI in the snow. I complain about their weather a lot. After I graduated, then I got a job at Kinko's for a while there. And I fell in love, got married. 
so it seems like I'm sort of stuck here. Which is too bad. I hate cold weather. I prefer warm air and have always wanted to move south. Ugh. Well, do you have any hobbies that you want to tell me about? Really, I love to read anything, any type of book. I also enjoy bike riding with David on our tandem bike. It allows me to be able to go biking and still feel independent. Also, I collect cat plates. I have a, a variety of them, and I love animals. I'm a strong supporter of PETA. I'm against anim animal abuse in the name of research. Those are a few of my hobbies. I guess those are the things that I do. Well, now, David, how about your hobbies? What do you do? Well, I'm just a couch potato. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I guess for my hobbies, I'd have to say I really enjoy football. A while ago, I was a semi-pro receiver. In... 1975, I was invited to the New York Giants training camp. We were part of what was called the Metro, um, what was it, Mailer? Yeah, Metro Mailer Group was kind of the, the s um, city organization that ran the training camp. They were paid to do that. In any case, I tried there for about one year, but being the only deaf person, it was very frustrating for me. It was very difficult because of the communication, so I had to come up with some codes for them for the different plays so that we would know whether you know it was a run to the right or which direction we were going with this. But there were so many different plays that it just got overwhelming. So it was really difficult and I really struggled with it until I decided that offense really wasn't the best position for me, that maybe defense would be better. I felt that I was quick enough to be on defense, but the coach was impressed with my ball handling ability and decided to keep me on offense. I really tried my best for that year, but I finally gave up and that's when I went to TVI. Now I really love to watch football on TV. I always try to guess which of the plays or the strategies the teams are going to be doing next. I guess another hobby is that I also enjoy spending time with my friends, just getting together with them socially. What about Star Trek? Oh, <laughs> that's right, I forgot. Yeah, I really love Star Trek. I collect Star Trek memorabilia. And just recently, I've started to really research the show. And I found out that the program isn't totally fiction, but that some of what the actors do is a replica of some of NASA's activities. And they use some of the same terminology. I'm really fascinated by the program perhaps because I work in a technical field, and they use a lot of technology on the ships. So th the program really intrigues me. So, Kimberly, thanks for reminding me of that. Well, this is a last question for you. If the two of you could share with us some more about your experiences growing up, also, I'm curious, uh, do you think people's attitudes have changed, becoming more positive, and do you think services for deaf and deafblind people have improved in recent years? Well, for me, when I was at the School for the Deaf, I had no idea that I had vision problems. I knew that something was wrong because my friends often teased me like I wasn't normal. I had many friends who would insult me and say that I had horse blinders on. I couldn't see very well at night either like my friends could. I just tried my best to interact with the other children. 
and naturally then, as I was growing up, my friends pulled pranks on me at bedtime. They would come up and poke me, and I couldn't see who it was, of course. I was frustrated, but I learned to tolerate it. Later, some of my friends confronted me about it, and because I wanted to be like everyone else, I told them I, I didn't have a vision problem. I was just daydreaming or not paying attention. One day I asked my mother why I couldn't see very well, and she decided to take me to the eye doctor. The doctor said that I had night blindness and some limitations regarding my peripheral vision, but didn't really know how severe it was. After I graduated from high school, as I said before, I was going to attend TVI. I'm not sure of the rationale, but at that time, TVI required an eye exam prior to starting school. Originally, I went to a regular eye doctor. I told him about my night blindness, and he was concerned. So he referred me to the University of Minnesota. I guess I didn't think it was a big deal at that time. I arrived in the morning, and there was a day um, of testing, and unfortunately I did not have an interpreter. I had an eye exam, and they put some drops in my eyes, which made my vision blur. I was really concerned about communicating with the medical staff, as I now could not write notes back and forth, and it was very emotional and challenging. And I was starving, but I was afraid to leave to get something to eat. I thought maybe they would call my name and I'd miss it. Well, finally at 3 o'clock, I was called back in to talk with the lead doctor, and he told me that I had retina pigmina. I didn't understand what that meant. That is the proper name for the type of the eye disease I have. The doctor gave me some special binocular-like glasses to read the information related to retina pigmina. When I asked the doctor what it meant for my future, he informed me that within six months I would be totally blind. I think when he told me that, oh, six months? It really hit me and I, I went numb. When I arrived home, I was in shock. I really felt alone and, and that I had no support. And then I called my parents and accused them of hiding this information from me, but they assured me that they honestly didn't know. As a result, my parents decided to bring all of my medical records from their home in Indiana here to me in Minnesota. And after reviewing the additional information my parents provided, the doctors at the university said that I wouldn't become blind within six months, which was a relief, but my field of vision would become very narrow. Of course, I was very much in denial at that point as I was active in the deaf community and really relied on my vision, but that didn't seem to be a problem. As I got older, my field of vision became smaller and watching signs was a lot more work. Now I use considerable amounts of energy while communicating with others and tire faster. And to be honest, some deaf people are disrespectful towards deafblind people. They don't understand our needs in regards to a limited field of vision and signing slower. I tend to miss a lot, and it's very frustrating. Due to the frustration, I started to withdraw from them. I basically let it go and became more involved with the deafblind community. We share a common bond and understand each other's situation. I didn't want to stay in the deaf community and feel isolated. Now my challenge is to go back to them and educate them. I use different glasses to help them understand how I see things so they can empathize with the deafblind population. I love my role as an educator. Sometimes people forget, and so I must be persistent and explain the limited field of, field of vision again and the importance of wearing dark clothes. So I have to really make an effort to instruct them. Soon people will be able to take a class at TVI, St. Paul Technical College, that focuses on interpreting for deafblind consumers. I'm really anxious for that to get started. Also, FIND Incorporated is setting up a program called the Deaf Blind and Deaf Bridge with the goal of developing a rapport between the two communities so that the deaf blind community isn't ignored. Another goal is to help the deaf blind community in accessing various organizations while working with an interpreter, basically, providing more opportunities for deaf blind individuals to be able to utilize the resources of the area. Very good. David, 
your perceptions of the community are what? Hmm. Well, I guess it's true. There are still problems within the community. Oh, I, I know from Kimberly's experiences, she's right. And that reminds me, it, it's true what happens at the schools with deafblind kids, that they do get picked on. And I was guilty party in, in that respect. Ironic now that I'm married to Kimberly. But I remember I used to sneak up behind the deafblind students while they were watching TV. And I'd wiggle my hand in their peripheral vision, slowly moving it forward, just to see how long before they'd notice me. When they would finally catch me, they'd tell me to knock it off. But she's also right about the bedtime pranks. In the dorm, I would sneak up and grab the deafblind student's arm or something, and then I'd just run away. Some of them, though, had a strong sense of touch, almost like their sense of touch was enhanced. So once in a while, when I'd try to poke or grab them, they'd grab me first so I couldn't get away. And then they could figure out who it was that was playing tricks on them. But you have to understand, I was young and I was immature at that point and, and not very respectful. Now that I'm older and I'm married to Kimberly, I do understand what they go through. Now, from a deaf person's perspective, I guess I had one traumatic experience that I can share, which happened at work. And of course, I didn't have an interpreter. That was in 1978 or no? 19 80, right, yeah, about 1980. So in any case, I was having a, my performance review with my supervisor and my supervisor's boss. So, you know, they were talking about my performance, how I was doing on the job, and whether or not I was ready to take on some additional responsibilities. Well, my immediate supervisor had filled out the form and was asking me to sign it without having read it first. If I did that, that meant that I agreed with his evaluation of my work. And I let him know that I preferred to read it first. But he didn't seem to want me to do that. So finally I went to my boss's superior. And from there the three of us had a meeting. During that meeting we wrote notes back and forth because again there was no interpreter. And I said, you know, I really detested that process because there was so much miscommunication happening and I was missing information. Now they were deciding on what steps I needed to take to improve myself and be eligible for promotions and it was really an unfair situation for me. Um, you know, I, I think it was very frustrating to go through that kind of a performance evaluation through writing. So I, I guess I just felt I missed too much information, didn't know what they were planning for me. Things have improved some now, but it's still a problem area. All right. Well, I want to thank the two of you for taking the time to come today. I really enjoyed chatting with you, and hopefully we will see each other more often in the future. Oh, thank you. Great, thanks. And thank you for tuning into our story today.